They have James Fathers Rights and Resources hashtag how I got custody. I want to talk about this tender years doctrine BS that's gone around for years and really well over a century now. Um, I was just talking to somebody who, and judges do this all the time. Somebody went in front of a judge and the judge said the child's too young for you to have more than a couple hours at a time. That's asinine. You know, why do we allow fathers to even have children if that's the case? In, in, when you're in an intact family, fathers are constantly waking up in the middle of the night. Let's say a married couple, they wake up in the middle of the night, feed their baby, take it to the bathroom when it gets sick and wants to throw up. I did it myself. I got custody of my daughter when she was seven months old. And I cared for every aspect of her life for uh, 19 years. I was there cleaning up the throw up, cleaning up diapers, bottle feeding her, feeding her period, doing everything that she needed. So I'm proof in and of itself. There's plenty of dads out there who've gotten custody of their kids when they were born from a crackhead mom or whatever. There's 2 million single custodial fathers in America. There's 20 million single mothers, route number 10 to 1. But um, if you're, you know, the Supreme Court case, Troxel versus Granville says that a fit parent is presumed to act in the best interest of the child. So I would be telling the court, you have to assume that I act in the best interest of my child. So you assume that I can care for my child. So you assume I'm not going to starve, damage, or harm my child. To presume that I can't handle an infant, a newborn, a baby, or whatever, is to be prejudicially bigoted toward me and to make a bunch of presumptions about me when there's no evidence. You should assume, since if, if fathers couldn't handle kids, if kids would die under the care of fathers, then society wouldn't exist right now. Because fathers have been there since mankind came into being. Now, this tender age doctrine, or tender years doctrine... I'm looking at it now. There was some lady back in England who didn't, you know, before, um, <clears throat> before, uh, from the early 1900s, you know, before 1940s or so something like that, you know, men used to always get custody because they could financially provide for the kids and women were kind of second class citizens. Well, in England, this lady named Caroline Norton, and you should, you should look this up and, and prepare for this type of argument if you got an infant. Caroline Norton is the one who pushed. She got. She didn't get. She not only lost custody of her kids when she got divorced in England in about eighteen thirty. So this is actually this is closer to two hundred years ago. I'm sorry. So she um, lost custody of her kids and had no contact with her three sons. Now that's pretty jacked up. Period. Okay. So the pendulum swung the other way and there was this custody of infants acts act custody of infants act in 1839, which made a presumption of custody to the mom until the kids were 18 or, uh, under the age of seven. Um, and, um, that actually gave discretion to the judge. And then about 40 years later, 30 years later, they gave a presumption of custody of the mom until 16. Now, this is over in England in the late 1800s, okay? So it was adopted by, you know, America <clears throat> closer to the mid-20th century. Um, there's a couple of psychologists who, who uh, jumped the bandwagon. And actually, it even says on the Wikipedia page for the Tender Years Doctrine... That some courts have held that the tenure, it, it violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. You know, um, a right to life, liberty, and property, life, liberty, and property without state interference. And that's been extended to parental rights. You have a presumption of the care and custody of your kids without state interference, unless there's a compelling interest, which is your murder or your child molester, etc. That's why the entire family court system is unconstitutional because of that, that doctrine of 14th Amendment Clause, Equal Protection Clause, and 14th Amendment Clause, Due Process Clause. Um, so there's also a study out there I used to have on my website that got um, screwed up because of a bad website provider. Um, Vistaprint sucks, and uh, so does Weebly. But there's a study out there that says kids need kids under four and under two need the father more than the mother 
because of the male affirmation that comes from them and things like that. I'll just contend and keep it easy that they kids need both parents equally as much as possible, unless there's abuse or neglect or one parent's crazy. So this thing about you can't handle the child. Now I had that in my own case. When I first got five days a week visitation, the judge told me you can only have the child four hours. You don't get the child the whole eight hours the mother's in work because number one, this is not a pet in a goldfish. That was King County Superior Court Judge Suzanne Barnett a big man-hating, radical feminist psycho. I guess she's not too man-hating because she gave me five days a week, but she was still bigoted <clears throat> in her presumption and in the culture of feminism in the court system. She was still bigoted in thinking, I can't handle the kid for more than four hours. She's like, this is not a goldfish, this is not a pet. And then she says, number two, you'll be too tired. Well, at that time, I was working a job that paid me for eight hours, but if we got done with our shift, we can go home. I could be done at four or five hours. So... But even if I work eight hours, and then I have the kid eight hours while the mom's at work, I have eight hours of rest and relaxation. The mother would go to work for eight hours and then have her kid 16 hours. She didn't have any R&R &R at all, or no breaks whatsoever from the kid or work. So the court was assuming I was inferior to the mother. Now, I should have jumped all over that. I didn't think about that till afterward, but I was just happy to get five days a week going from zero to five, from nothing to five days a week, was, was a huge thing. So... Um, I would go into court now saying, I'd wait for the judge to say, you know, the uh, tender age doctrine or tender years doctrine or an attorney to say that and say, that would be a presumptuous, bigoted, anti-father, anti-male gender discrimination against me to presume that I can't handle a child. When, number one, where is the scientific evidence and data that says a child is in danger under a father's care? Actually, every statistic out there shows the safest place for a child is with the biological father. Women commit 60% of uh, all recorded child abuse. That's according to the federal statistics in the, in the United States. Um, women commit just as much as domestic violence as men. Some studies say they do it more and it's underreported because, you know, men don't want to admit that they got beat up or they got, you know, hit, kicked, pummeled by their, by their ex. And <clears throat> most of the child molesters are the mom's new boyfriend or new husband because they're detached from that child. The, the, the child's not their biological, so they're detached from them. So that being said, the safest place for a child, statistically speaking, is with the biological father. Now, it's best in an intact family, out of, outside of broken families, the safest place is with the father. So, um, so the child's safe, statistically speaking, with me, under my care, and you're saying I can't have the child for more than a couple hours? What is stopping you from giving the child to me? Now, a lot of people, the person I talked to earlier is like, what do, I, what do I make an argument for me? No, it's against the judge's findings. A judge has to make a finding of fact and conclusion of law. If they just said, oh, well, you can't handle it because of tender age doctor. Where did you get that from? Oh, well, that's what we've always done. Okay, well, Mississippi courts in the 50s always, you know, didn't give black people a fair trial. They always gave them the electric chair. They always found them guilty. That's just what we always done. So that makes it right. You have to make a finding of fact. What are you basing that off of? A rumor that you heard? Is that what we're doing? Well, I heard a rumor that the mother is crazy and she threatens to stab and kill the child. Why don't you give me custody because of that? Or are we going to go off of actual evidence? You need, to, you need to tell me the statistical basis for not allowing a father to have a child in equal amount of time because they're an infant. You need to tell me what the scientific risks are. But you know what? There's been no expert testimony under ER, Evidence Rule 702, there's been no expert testimony of an expert testifying that this child is in danger under a father's care. And then, of course, there's countless fathers who raise their children, wake up in the middle of the night, bathe, clothe, and clean, and take care of them when they're sick, and bottle feed them, or whatever, in the middle of the night while the mother's sleeping and resting and recovering. So you're saying that can't happen? There's countless examples of it working and a dad doing fine with that. So you're going contrary to facts, evidence, the overwhelming knowledge of the average American and what goes on in intact families all the time. So you're saying because we're broken up, I'm all of a sudden an incapable father. That's a bigoted, sexist, discriminatory presumption that's not rooted in, in any evidence and it's not even allowed because you're not an expert and you're not a psychologist and nobody's evaluated me or observed me with a child. So you have to presume that I'm acting in the child's best interest. End of story.